I moved to the UK in early 2020. I know, timing. But before I had even moved here, I signed up for the Lakeland 50, expecting to run it in July 2020. Now, another year later, the day has finally come. Since this is England, Lakeland 50 means 50 miles, or about 80 kilometers. One of my longest races so far. And given the terrain of the Lake District, it would certainly be the hardest. Thank you, keep moving, have a good day. The race start was shortly before noon, which wasn't exactly ideal in the uncharacteristically hot weather. People keep telling me it always rains in the Lake District, but I'm starting to believe that that's a myth. After a local loop around the Delamain estate in the northeast of the Lake District, we set off on the meandering route towards Coniston in the south. The first leg of it was fairly flat, but it still had a big enough hill on it to deliver some lovely views. Oh, and you see the guys with the red numbers? They're doing the 100 mile race, and have been at it since yesterday evening. That's right, the Lakeland 50 is the baby version of this event. It was on the second leg that the real work started. This wasn't just the longest leg, but it also contained the biggest climb. And what's more, we were doing it during the hottest part of the day. After the big climb of leg 2, the route dropped down again, towards Haaswater Reservoir, and followed the banks of it for a few more miles. And while this bit was quite flat, the rocky, overgrown trail wasn't great for making a good pace. By this point I had to ration my water to avoid running out completely before the next checkpoint at Mardale, at the end of the reservoir. Mild dehydration always hits me in the stomach first, so even before I felt any issues I knew I had to revise my nutrition plan. My new strategy at the Mardale checkpoint was to take on only minimal solid food, but to try and get as many liquid calories as I could while rehydrating myself. I don't usually have coke during a race, unless things have gone quite badly wrong. But in this case, it seemed like the right tool to manage my issues before they got out of hand. Out of the Mardale checkpoint, the route went straight up another steep hill, followed by a long descent on another rocky track. The kind of track that would very much like to twist your ankles. Certainly one that isn't easy to run down, even if your legs were fresh. On the legs I had at this point, running was mostly limited to the grass verges, where there were any, or had to wait for the track to smoothen out lower in the valley. When we finally came to a right turn a few miles later, it was almost a relief to be rid of this track, even though it meant going up another hill. On the other side of that hill, we could look forward to smoothies and pasta at the Kentmere checkpoint, just past the halfway mark. Tea, coffee, more drinks, we've got sweets, we've got an exit. After Kentmere, the hills continued in a similar fashion. Two climbs and two descents to the next checkpoint. Though on this leg, they were slightly less gruesome. Perhaps mainly because the temperatures were starting to come down a bit. The second hill of the section provided some of the best views of the course, with Windermere sparkling in the evening sun. After taking in those views, we descended through some woodland towards Ambleside the biggest town on the route. I think I hit Ambleside at a pretty good time. There were quite a few dedicated spectators about, and a lot of people just having their dinner or enjoying a pint were getting in on the action. Cheers. After Ambleside came what I would argue is the easiest leg. It only had a little hill in the beginning, before continuing for several miles on fairly smooth paths along the water towards the checkpoint at Chapel Style. An excellent leg, in fact, on which to find a decent second wind in the evening temperatures. I passed the Chapel Style checkpoint just after sunset. Yeah, of course. No problem. Well done. 
Soon after that checkpoint, the course turned to the hills again. And with the end of the flat section, my second wind also came to an end. Still, the transformation of the scenery and atmosphere as the night fell was a blissful change of pace. My GoPro doesn't show much in the deep, dark night, but I could see paradise by my head torch light. Great, thank you very much. Big old cheers. Unfortunately, it didn't feel like paradise. But with less than 10 miles left, I was close enough to the finish to push through. A sign somewhere earlier on the course had said, you didn't come this far to only come this far. At the final checkpoint, I had a flapjack and a cup of coffee. Please don't judge me. After that, there was only one hill left. Oh, nice change to use my hands. But even with the caffeine boost, this last climb seemed to go on and on. And so did the final descent under the moonlight. First on a rocky trail, then a rough track, then a cinder road, then a paved one. And then I turned the corner and saw lights. For a few moments my brain was trying to see them as other runners had torches. But they were the street lamps of Coniston. And suddenly, after 13 hours of running, I found myself in a town that was still very much awake despite it being well past midnight. The final few turns were pointed out by marshals, which felt a bit weird after having been responsible for my own navigation for so long. It's over now, you think, as a volunteer escorts you towards the finisher's area in the marquee. And what a nice reception, you think, as he starts asking you about your favorite parts of the course and telling you to sign up for the 100th next year. But for now, it's all over. So you switch off the camera. But it isn't all over. As we enter the marquee, the volunteer checks the pronunciation of my name. And before I really get the chance to wonder why, he turns to the half-drunk crowd leaning on the barriers and announces, This is Mats, 50 finisher. A massive cheer follows as I am steered in the direction of a shiny medal, a quick photo shoot, and some well-earned food.